The search for a shortcut from Europe to Asia began in the 15th century from explorers such as Christopher Columbus, Vasco da Gama, Bartholomew Diaz. Trade from Europe to Asia was a lengthy task. The Silk Road, beginning all the way back in the 2nd century BCE, spanning 4,000 miles, going by land or by boat to Turkey, traveling across the Middle East to Asia. The Silk Road had different routes. The main route led from Constantinople through Syria and Iraq, across Iran, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and into China. Other trade routes branched off into Kazakhstan, Mongolia, into Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India, and into Southeast Asia. To travel the Silk Road and return with trade goods was a two-year journey. Long to say the least, but the Silk Road was busy for around 1500 years until the Ottoman Empire cut off trade with the West in the 1400s. After the Silk Road ended, the only way to trade was to sail all the way around the tip of Africa, known as the Cape of Good Hope, around South Africa and into India, which was a long and arduous journey in itself. It took six months to travel from England to India, one year round trip, much shorter than going across land via the Silk Road. In the 1400s, explorers were tasked with finding a shortcut to India by traveling west into uncharted seas until 1492 when Columbus found the Americas, not a shortcut into India. But that is not where it ends. The islands between Greenland and Canada were thought to have been a shortcut over the Americas, in between Alaska and Russia, and down to India. The islands are known as the Arctic Archipelago. The Hudson Bay Company explored the Canadian coastlines and some of the interior. It was believed a shortcut existed through the Arctic. Many explorers went through this region, but no one was successful in finding the Northwest Passage. In 1804, Sir John Barrow became the second secretary of the Admiralty. He began pushing the Royal Navy to launch expeditions to find the Northwest Passage. Between 1804 and 1845, many explorers went on expeditions. John Ross, David Buchan, William Edward Perry, Frederick William Beechey, James Clark Ross, George Back, Peter Warren Deese, and Thomas Simpson. One man, John Franklin, was second in command in an 1818 expedition on the ships Dorothea and Trent. He was the leader of two overland expeditions, one from 1819 to 1822, the other from 1825 to 1827. The 1819 expedition was called the Coppermine Expedition. To chart the coasts of Canada, he fell into the Hayes River at Robson's Fall and needed to be rescued by his fellow members. During the mission, he lost 11 of the 20 men, most to starvation, but one died of murder. The reason is believed to be because of cannibalism. They survived by eating lichen off of rocks and eating their own boots. This gave John Franklin the nickname, the man who ate his own boots. In 1845, Barrow was 82 years old and at the end of his career, and he thought he was close to finding the Northwest Passage. He made a list of potential leaders for the expeditions. William Perry, his first choice, was tired of the Arctic and declined the commission. James Clark, his second choice, declined because he told his wife he was done with polar exploring. James Fitzjames, the third choice, was denied by the Admiralty because he was too young and inexperienced. He considered George Back, but thought he was too argumentative for the task. Francis Crozier, another possibility, was Irish, and the Admiralty wanted a British High Society member to lead the mission. They settled on 59-year-old John Franklin. Two old warships were converted into Arctic ships. The Erebus, 378 tons, and the Terror, 331 tons. They were fitted with iron plating to protect from the ice, and each ship had a steam engine converted from a locomotive from the London and Croydon Railroad. The ships could reach four knots on steam power and use sails to go faster and to save fuel. They had a single screw propeller that could be brought back into the ship to prevent damage. The ships were heated with pipes that went through the ships to keep the sailors warm. Crozier was put in command of the Terror and Franklin was in charge of the flagship, the Erebus. The ships were stocked well for the journey. The total supplies on both ships were 36,487 pounds of biscuits, 
136,656 pounds of flour, 1,203 pounds of pemmican, a mixture of tallow, dried meat, and sometimes berries, usually made with bison, deer, or elk, 32,224 pounds of beef, 32,000 pounds of pork, 33,259 pounds of tinned meat, 23,576 pounds of sugar, 8,900 pounds of canned vegetables, 3,684 gallons of spirits, 200 gallons of wine for the sick, 3,052 pounds of suet, this is fat from lamb or cows, 1,008 pounds of raisins, 147 bushels of peas, 9,450 pounds of chocolate, 2,357 pounds of tea, 9,300 pounds of lemon juice to stave off scurvy, 20,463 pints of concentrated soup, 1,326 gallons of vinegar, 2,496 pounds of barley, 1,350 gallons of oatmeal, 580 gallons of pickles, 170 gallons of cranberries, 1,000 pounds of mustard, 200 pounds of pepper, 7,088 pounds of tobacco, 3,600 pounds of soap, 2,700 pounds of candles, 2,400 volumes of books, 70 slates, 200 pens, 100 Bibles, 100 prayer books, and one daguerreotype apparatus used for taking photos for the expedition. The three ships were provisioned for three years. Every day the men would get one pound of biscuits or flour, two and a half pounds of sugar, a quarter pound of tea, one ounce of chocolate, and one ounce of lemon juice to stave off scurvy. Twice a week they would get three quarters of a pound of salt pork and salt beef. Three times a week, three quarters of a pound of tinned meat, and once a week, one pint of soup. The canned meat was contracted to the lowest bidder, a man named Goldner. The cans were rushed. A shoddy soldering job was done, but this was partly the Navy's fault for the delay. Given only a few weeks for the 32,289 pounds of canned meat to be ready. Back in the 1840s, it was thought vinegar and pickles stayed off scurvy, not just lemon juice, hence the pickles and vinegar on board. There were also theatrical equipment on board for the men to put on plays. The officers from the HMS Erebus consisted of Sir John Franklin, Captain, 59, James Fitz James, Commander, 31, Graham Gore, Lieutenant, 39, Henry Le Viscontier, Lieutenant, 32, James Fairholme, Lieutenant, 24, Robert Sargent, Mate, 24, Charles De Vokes, Mate, 19, Edward Couch, Mate, 22, James Reed, Ice Master, Unknown, Henry Collins, Second Master, 27, Charles Osmer, Playmaster and Purser, 46, Stephen Stanley, Surgeon, Unknown, and Harry Goodsir, Assistant Surgeon, 25. The other jobs they had on board were Engineer, Carpenter, Boatswain, Boatswain's Mate, Carpenter mate, ship's cook, captain steward, subordinate officer steward, playmaster and purser steward, gunroom steward, captain of the forecastle, captain of the hold, captain of the foretop, captain of the main top, caulker, caulker's mate, quartermaster, blacksmith, sailmaker, captain's coxswain, lead stoker, stoker, armorer, able bodied seamen, members of the Royal Marines, and the cabin boys. The HMS Terror's officers were Francis Crozier, Captain, 48, Edward Little, Lieutenant, 33, George Hodson, Lieutenant, 28, John Irvin, Lieutenant, 30, Frederick Hornbury, Mate, 25, Robert Thomas, Mate, Unknown, Thomas Blanky, Ice Master, 45, Gillis McBean, Second Master, 28, Edward Heltman, Clerk in Charge, 22, John Petty, Surgeon, 24, and Alexander MacDonald, Surgeon's Assistant, 27. Both ships consisted of 134 officers and men total. The expedition set sail from Greenwich, Kent on May 19, 1845 with 134 officers and men. Five would later return home due to sickness. The ship stopped at Stromness in the Orkney Islands in Scotland. They sailed to Greenland with the transport ships, the Barreto Jr. and the HMS Rattler. The trip took 30 days. At Disco Bay in Greenland, 10 oxen were killed for fresh meat and taken on board. The crew wrote their last letters home. 
and the five men were sent home, we learned in the letters Franklin had banned drunkenness and swearing. In July 1845, the two ships were spotted by two whaling ships, the Prince of Wales and the Enterprise. This was the last sighting by Europeans. They were in Baffin Bay waiting for good weather to cross the Lancaster Sound. The only information we have directly from the expedition is what was written in the two-part victory note, which we will read later. The expedition spent the winter of 1845 to 1846 on Beachy Island. Three graves were found by search parties later on. The graves contained Petty Officer John Torrington, Royal Marine Private William Brain, and able-bodied seaman John Hartnell. In 1984, the sailors were excavated and autopsies were performed. John Torrington's coffin was 4 feet 11 inches deep in the permafrost. The bodies were all frozen and needed to be defrosted by pouring hot water to melt the ice. The body was thought to have been stored on the ship while the grave was being dug. They found that his brain was almost completely gone and cell autolysis had occurred. He was very sick at his time of death, weighing only 85 pounds. At 5 foot 4, his body had high amounts of lead, but the cause of death was pneumonia after suffering lung problems aggravated by lead poisoning. William Brain was in the worst condition. His body had been gnawed by rats on board the ship while his grave was being dug. His cause of death was tuberculosis and lead poisoning. John Hartnell's body had already been autopsied in 1846 when he had died. In 2016, an analysis was conducted on his fingernail and toenail that were removed by Owen Beatty's 1984 team. They found his cause of death was most likely malnourishment and zinc deficiency. It is thought the expedition left in a hurry. No note was left, which was a practice by the Royal Navy. Many personal items were left behind. The ships were stuck in the ice, and it is thought once the ice let go of the ships, Sir John wanted to leave immediately. Two left-hand gloves were found on the ground, thought to be left out to dry. They both had a small heart worked into the leather on the palm, a bone comb, a surgeon's tourniquet, buttons with thread attached, a holy bible, telescope lens, a fish hook, a knife, sextant eyepiece, a brass matchbox, musket balls, and many other items, including a large rubbish pile with hundreds of tin cans. They traveled through Peel Sound the summer of 1846 and again were trapped in the ice off King William Island in September of 1846. It is thought they were never sailed again. The Victory Point note was a document found by search parties. It is the only written account we have from the expedition. 28th of May, 1847. HMS ships Erebus and Terror wintered in the ice at lat 70 degrees 5 north, long 98 degrees 23 west. Having wintered in 1846 to 1847 at Beachy Island in lat 74 degrees 43 28 north, longitude 91 degrees 39 at 15 west. After having ascended Wellington Channel to latitude 70 degrees and returned by the west side of Cornwall Island. Sir John Franklin commanding the expedition, all well. Parties consisting of two officers and six men left the ships on May 24, 1847. GM Gore LT Chas F. DeVoe Mate. Written in the margin, a second update was written. 25th of April, 1848, HMS ships Terror and Erebus were deserted on the 22nd of April. Five leagues north-northwest of this having been beset since 12th of September, 1846. The officers and crews, consisting of 105 souls under the command of Captain F.R.M. Crozier, landed here in lat 69 degrees 37 42, longitude 98 degrees 41. This paper was found by Lieutenant Irving under cairn supposed to have been built by Sir James Ross in 1831, four miles northward of where it had been deposited by the late Commander Gore in May 1847. Sir James Ross pillar has not, however, been found, and the paper has been transferred to this position, which is that in which Sir J. Ross pillar was erected. Sir John Franklin died on the 11th of June, 1847, and the total loss by deaths in the expedition has been to this date 9 officers and 15 men. James Fitzjames, Captain HMS Erebus, 
FRM Crozier Captain and Senior Officer and start on tomorrow 26th for Backfish River. In September of 1846 the ships got stuck in the ice and on April 25th 1848 the ships were still stuck in the ice for a year and a half over 500 days. Usually in the summer months the ice melts and the ships can set sail again but this time it did not. It had gotten so bad that they were willing to walk to mainland Canada instead of waiting for the ice to melt. Ice reports dating to this time period show almost no melting of the ice. A very cold summer for a few years in a row. The Victory Point note was found 11 years after it was written in 1859 by William Hobson on the northwest coast of King William Island. They also found an almost identical document containing the first message written in 1847 a few miles southwest at Gore Point. After two years had passed, Lady Jane Franklin grew concerned for her husband and his expedition. She urged the Admiralty to send search parties. They thought it was not necessary. They had provisions for three years and had means to hunt and fish. But by 1848, they developed a rescue plan. An overland rescue party led by John Richardson and John Ray, traveling down the Mackenzie River to the Arctic coast. Two more search parties were sent by sea, led by James Clark Ross, going in through the Lancaster Sound. The other party, led by Henry Kellett, entering from the Pacific side of Canada. A reward of 22,000 pounds to any party or parties of any country who shall render assistance to the crews of the Discovery ships under command of Sir John Franklin. All three search parties failed. In 1850, 11 British and two American ships traveled the Arctic in search for the lost expedition. It is when the first signs of the expedition were found. The camp at Beachy Island was discovered, along with the relics left behind, and the three graves of Torrington, Hartnell, and Brain. In 1851, several ships saw two ships on a massive iceberg off the Newfoundland coast, one up and the other on its beam end. Unfortunately, these ships were not the Erebus or the Terror, but two abandoned whaling ships. In 1852, an expedition ended in disaster when five ships set out to search, led by Edward Belcher, and four of the five ships were abandoned, stuck in the ice pack. Belcher was court-martialed, but was later acquitted. In 1854, Ray Richardson was surveying for the Hudson's Bay Company when he met an Inuit near current day Kargook in Nunavut. He told him of a party of 35 to 40 white men who died of starvation near the Back River. Other Inuit confirmed this story with reports of cannibalism. The Inuit showed Ray relics belonging to the Franklin expedition in their possession. Ray bought from the Inuit silverware later being identified as belonging to Franklin, Fitzjames, Crozier, Fairholme, and Sargent. With this knowledge and items recovered, the Admiralty was urged to send a party to Back River. In July of 1855, James Anderson and James Stewart traveled to the Back River and were told of white men who starved to death at the coast. In August of 1855, the two men found a piece of wood with Erebus inscribed onto it and one with Mr. Stanley carved into it on Montreal Island. The Admiralty did not plan any other searches. On March 31st, 1854, Britain officially labeled the crew deceased. Lady Franklin was not convinced. She funded another search led by Francis Leopold McClintock on the schooner Fox. It had set sail July 2nd, 1857. In 1859, the sled parties left the schooner to search King William Island. This is when William Hobson found the Victory Point note and another in the cairn. The expedition also found a human skeleton still clothed on the southern coast of the island. Papers were found on the skeleton. One, a seaman's certificate for Chief Petty Officer Harry Pelger captain of the foretop, HMS Terror. But the uniform on the skeleton was a ship's steward uniform. It is believed the man was Thomas Armitage, a gunroom steward and shipmate of Pelger. A lifeboat containing two skeletons and relics was found. The boat contained many relics of the expedition. 
boots, silk handkerchief, soap, sponges, slippers, hair combs, many books including The Vicar of Wakefield. Two other expeditions between 1860 and 1869 by Charles Francis Hall. He lived with the Inuit on Baffin Island and near Repulse Bay on the Canadian mainland. He found other graves, camps, and scattered relics on the southern coast of King William Island. In 1869, an Inuit took Hall to a grave where he found a well-preserved skeleton with clothing still remaining. The remains were taken back to England. A biologist, Thomas Huxley, examined the skeleton and believed it to be Henry Dunas Le Viscontier, second lieutenant from the Erebus. But in 2009, they were re-examined and it is believed to be the assistant surgeon from the Arius. Harry Goodsir. Hall gathered hundreds of pages of testimony from the Inuit who had seen the lost expedition. Among these testimonies, there are descriptions of the Inuit visiting an abandoned ship and finding skeletons and bones inside that had been broken open near the fireplace and piles of shoes outside the ship. Descriptions of the Inuit meeting survivors of an expedition. The white men were without fur clothing, some very thin. Their mouths were hard and dry and black. One man was a doctor, a little older than the others, with a big black beard. Mixed with gray, he was bigger and broader than the others. In 1992, Barry Rainford and Mike Yerskovich discovered bones near Terre Bay. In 1993, a team returned and found nearly 400 bones and relics from the expedition. The bones showed elevated levels of lead and many bones had cut marks, evidence of cannibalism. Bones showed signs of breaking to retrieve the bone marrow and pot polishing from being boiled in a pot of water. The very last signs of cannibalism, the desperate stages. Searches for the wrecks had been going on for decades, but in 2014, a Canadian team used testimony from the Inuit to search with side scan sonar at locations the Inuit had seen the ships. On September 7, 2014, they had located one of the ships, the HMS Erebus. The flagship of the expedition, Sir John Franklin, in 36 feet of water at the bottom of Wilmot and Crampton Bay, west of O'Reilly Island. In 2016, on September 12th, it was announced that the HMS Terror was discovered in Terror Bay, 79 feet down and in pristine condition. The group concluded the ships had not been anchored, the cables were secure along the bulwarks. 2021, a body found by McClintock in 1859 was identified using DNA. It was identified as an engineer from the Erebus, John Gregory. Members from the Franklin Expedition made it all the way across the Simpson Strait. Remains were found on the Canadian mainland, on the Adelaide Peninsula. The Simpson Strait does indeed connect the two oceans, so they did in fact find the Northwest Passage. The passage would not be completely navigated until 1906 when Roald Odmanson sailed the passage via the Simpson Strait. Some believe some of the men left alive did not travel with the lifeboats across King William Island. They stayed with the ships and made one last effort in the terror to sail away, pull up anchor, and make it to Terror Bay, only to sink in its chilled waters. The big mistake the survivors that set off for the river made was dragging the lifeboats. Filled with all the items from the ship, a group demonstrated how difficult it would be to drag a loaded down lifeboat across the snow versus a nearly empty boat. They traveled miles ahead in just a short time. If the men did not bring all these extra items, they might have made it. They ultimately abandoned the boats in the end. The Inuit describe an encounter meeting the men dragging the lifeboat. They gave the men seal meat and then left knowing that if they took the men in, it would be Other Inuits found camps along their trail. They found an overturned boat used as a shelter with bones and bodies, kettles with remnants of meat. The men had turned to cannibalism on the journey across King William Island. The Inuit also describe a lone ship drifting in the ice a hundred miles from where the ships were abandoned. Oral traditions of the Inuit 
all tell stories of a ship south of where the ships were thought to be. This is what actually led to the discovery of the ships. The Canadian team used their sonar all over the described areas from the Inuit. While Professor Doug Stanton was leading another team to search on land for evidence, Coast Guard helicopter pilot Andrew Sterling was flying over to spot any anomalies on land. When they landed to Walka Beach, he noticed a piece of metal that looked out of place behind a rock. The iron item was marked with Royal Navy broad arrows. It was positive this came from a Royal Navy ship. The hallmarks were used in the 19th century to identify Navy property. The item turned out to be a fitting off of one of the ship's cranes. The fitting was large and heavy. It could not have been far from the ship that it came off of. This is what brought the team with the sonar over and ultimately found the Erebus. None of this would have been possible without the oral traditions of the Inuit people, which was the reason they were searching in the first place. Some of the artifacts were given to England, but the Canadian government and the Inuit people now own the wrecks. This story has all of it. New technology made the men feel invincible. It has tragedy, desperation, hope, and ultimately unbelievable accounts of cannibalism. Some of the mysteries are solved, but many are still unknown. This has been the story of the Lost Franklin Expedition. Now I, like most people, have been fascinated with this story since I was a kid. Anything, whether it be Mount Everest, survival stories, Franklin Expedition, the Donner Party, everything. Obsessed with history, especially when there's tales of survival. This story really does have it all. And there's still mysteries out there that we might never know. But the tales from the Inua people, really, they were discounted back in the day. The British saw the Inuit as savages, you know, they didn't take, they took what they said with a grain of salt. When the tales of cannibalism came back, the British high society went, up in arms about this. They completely discredited everything that the Inuit said, but it turns out the Inuit were right all along. And the Inuit testimony is what led to the finding of the ships. I am sure there is many, 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 many graves out there and just bones laying where they fell and artifacts strewn everywhere on King William Island and even on the mainland. There are some bones and Artifacts that made it all the way to mainland Canada. Now imagine that. These people had boats. They had fuel. They had food. A heated ship. They had pipes heating up the ship. But things had gotten so bad that they decided to walk hundreds and hundreds of miles across on islands, across the water, the frozen water. They decided to cross to mainland Canada to try to get all the way to an outpost hundreds of miles away and they threw everything they had into the boats hooked up harnesses and they walked and they walked and they walked basically the whole length of King William Island how desperate of a situation do you have to be in for that to happen they must have thought that ship was gonna sink because for them to leave like that Unless they were completely out of food, which the Inuit testimony disagrees with that. They must have thought the ship was right then and there going to sink. But obviously it didn't because that's not where the ships were found. They were found to the south end of King William Island. So the ships must have traveled down that way, whether it be stuck in the ice pack or drifting down the coast like the Inuit described. But ultimately, I think dragging the ships with all that stuff. They threw books in there, slippers, scarves, canned food, whatever. They threw tons of useless garbage into that boat. Now, I watched a documentary when I was much younger about there was these, some soldiers that they were had out in the ice with basically the same kind of lifeboat. They had a full one and they had an empty one. And the full one, oh my God, for them to drag that thing a hundred yards took hours and for the empty one they went miles it was unbelievable how much faster they could travel with the empty lifeboat and i'm sure they were bringing the lifeboat so that they could travel across because they were on an island they had to get 
across the straits and across waterways to get to the Canadian mainland. So they had to bring the boats, but unfortunately, men started dropping and had to get into the boats and dragged by the other sailors. And it killed them. If you stop when you're all sweaty, I mean, they had wool clothes back then. You sweat, you're going to die because you're going to freeze to death. You do not want to sweat when you're in the Arctic, when you're cold like that. You sweat, you die. You stop, you die. If you don't have shelter, you're going to die. So for them to do that was incredible. And that just shows how desperate they really were. There's a lot more. I could have gone on and on and on for an hour and a half, two hours about this story. There are so many other expeditions that came after this. But I wanted to throw it all together here in one video. I hope you enjoyed. I'm going to stop rambling now. Please leave a comment, like below, comments, criticisms, everything you got, people. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you on the next. Peace. Peace.